This audio lecture is based entirely upon the casebook, Professional Responsibility, an open source casebook by Brian L. Fry and Elizabeth Schiller. The casebook is licensed Creative Commons Zero, no rights reserved. That means that the authors have explicitly disclaimed any copyright claim in all of the original elements that they created in writing this casebook and have intentionally placed the casebook in the public domain. Much thanks is due to Brian and Elizabeth for writing this book and placing it in the public domain for everybody to use. In furtherance of this spirit of open source, I also license this audio lecture as Creative Commons Zero, No Rights Reserved. I hope you enjoy. Welcome everybody to the Practice of Law audio lecture. This lecture has a few sections. So first I'll talk about a brief introduction to professional responsibility and the history of the legal profession. Then I'll turn to the attorney-client relationship that is creating an attorney-client relationship, ending an attorney-client relationship, discuss the attorney as agent, the client as principal. Then we'll talk about ex parte communications, attorney's fees, financial relationships with clients, organizations as clients, and then agents as clients. Then the next section we'll talk about the duties or the legal duties of an attorney, his or her fiduciary duties legal malpractice, and ineffective assistance of counsel. Then in the next section, we'll talk about conflicts of interest, identifying conflicts of interest, resolving conflicts of interest, breach of the duty of loyalty, current client conflicts of interest, former client conflicts of interest, associational conflicts of interest, and then other specific conflicts of interest, including personal conflicts of interest. Then in the next section, we'll talk about confidentiality, the duty of confidentiality, exceptions to the duty of confidentiality, the attorney-client privilege, applying the attorney-client privilege, corporate privilege, the work product doctrine, and exceptions to privilege and work product. Then in the next section, we'll talk about advocacy and conduct. Frivolous pleadings, improper advocacy, attorney misconduct, client perjury, and alternative dispute resolution. Then in the final section, we'll talk about the regulation of the legal profession, bar admission, advertising, solicitation, prosecutorial misconduct, judicial recusal, and misconduct. So section one, the introduction. What is professional responsibility? Professional responsibility is the only class that the American Bar Association explicitly requires law schools to provide in order to qualify for accreditation. Under the ABA's 2020-2021 standards and rules of procedure for approval of law schools, a law school shall maintain a rigorous program of legal education that prepares its students upon graduation for admission to the bar and for effective ethical and responsible participation as members of the legal profession. Accordingly, a law school must establish learning outcomes that shall, at a minimum, include competency in the exercise of proper professional and ethical responsibilities to clients and the legal system, and other professional skills needed for competent and ethical participation as a member of the legal profession. And in order to satisfy that requirement, 
a law school must offer a curriculum that requires each student to satisfactorily complete at least one course of at least two credit hours in professional responsibility. It includes substantial instruction in the rules of professional conduct and the values and responsibilities of the legal profession and its members. However, law schools and law professors retain considerable discretion in how they teach professional responsibility. While the ABA accreditation standards provide that law schools must require a professional responsibility class, they do not specify what subjects the class must cover or how it should be taught. Law schools typically delegate those decisions to law professors who have adopted a wide range of different approaches. Some classes focus on the ABA's model rules of professional conduct and how courts use them to regulate attorneys. Other classes focus on the concept of legal ethics and the justification of the legal profession. And still other classes focus on how attorneys actually comply with rules of professional conduct in practice. We'll focus on the model rules of professional conduct and their practical application. Moving to legal ethics versus the regulation of legal practice. Different lawyers think about professional responsibility in different ways. Different law professors teach professional responsibility in different ways. And different legal scholars conceptualize professional responsibility in different ways. Some attorneys, professors, and scholars see professional responsibility as the practice of legal ethics. In other words, they believe that the rules of professional responsibility are expressions of ethical principles. And the legitimacy of those rules depends on the legitimacy of the ethical principles they express. But other attorneys, professors, and scholars see professional responsibility as merely the regulation of legal practice. In other words, they believe that the rules of professional responsibility are just the positive law governing attorneys and legal ethics. Legal ethics can be either Descriptive or normative. While both descriptive and normative legal ethics investigate the ethical values motivating the law of professional responsibility, they do so in very different ways, with fundamentally different goals. Descriptive legal ethics asks what the ethical values of law of professional responsibility are. The normative legal ethics ask what they should be. Descriptive legal ethics assumes that the statutes and rules governing the practice of law, as well as the cases interpreting and applying those statutes and rules, effectively express the ethical values of the legal profession. Accordingly, by studying the law of professional responsibility in action, one can identify the ethical values inherent in the law that motivate its articulation, interpretation, and application. Normative legal ethics asks whether the law of professional responsibility expresses a true moral theory. In other words, it starts with a moral theory and asks whether the law of professional responsibility produces results consistent with that theory. Different normative theories of legal ethics may adopt different moral theories, but they all assume that the purpose of the law of professional responsibility is to produce moral outcomes. Accordingly, the law of professional responsibility is justified if it expresses a true moral theory and unjustified if it does not. Now, the regulation of legal practice. Initially, we will focus on the regulation of the legal practice, not legal ethics. The primary purpose is to help you better understand how the bar and the courts actually apply the statutes and rules governing the practice of law. 
The various bar associations, often in conjunction with the courts, adopt disciplinary rules regulating legal practice. Some of those rules are mandatory and define what attorneys must and must not do. Other rules are discretionary and describe what attorneys may and may not do. And still other rules are aspirational and explain what attorneys should and should not do. When the court considers a complaint against an attorney, they typically apply the disciplinary rules adopted by the Bar Association in light of generally applicable legal principles. In other words, they ask not only whether the attorney violated the letter or spirit of the disciplinary rules, but also whether the rules at issue are valid and enforceable. However, a court may find that an attorney who has not violated the disciplinary rules has still violated some other legal duty. Accordingly, we will focus on describing the law of professional responsibility, explaining how it has been applied, and asking whether it was applied correctly. Note that the law of professional responsibility differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Sometimes those differences are minor, but other times they are fundamental. We will initially focus on describing, explaining, and reflecting on the application of the most paradigmatic rules, as exemplified by the model rules of professional conduct and the restatement of the law governing lawyers. Studying an area of law inevitably provokes reflections on its purpose and justification. What values does the law of professional responsibility express? Are those values justified? What makes a rule of professional conduct justified or unjustified? What is the purpose of the law of professional responsibility? All of these ethical issues are implicit in the subject matter of this course. While this course may directly or indirectly raise those questions, it does not purport to answer them or take a position on how they should be answered. Now, the model rules of professional conduct, the preamble and scope. The preamble states that a lawyer, as a member of the legal profession, is a representative of clients, an officer of the legal system, and a public citizen having special responsibility for the quality of justice. As a representative of clients, a lawyer performs various functions. As advisor, a lawyer provides a client with an informed understanding of the client's legal rights and obligations and explains their practical implications. As advocate, a lawyer zealously asserts the client's position under the rules of the adversary system. As negotiator, a lawyer seeks a result advantageous to the client, but consistent with the requirements of honest dealings with others. As an evaluator, a lawyer acts by examining a client's legal affairs and reporting about them to the client or to others. Now, the duty of so-called zealous representation. Perhaps the most fundamental duty of an attorney is the duty of zealous representation. Attorneys must represent the interests of their clients to the best of their ability and to the extent permitted by the law. And attorneys must always advocate for their clients' interests to the exclusion of anyone else's interests, including their own. Specifically, attorneys must zealously represent their clients' interests, even at their own expense. But the duty of zealous representation can conflict with an attorney's other duties, especially an attorney's duties to the court. As members of the bar, attorneys are also officers of the court. Among other things, they owe the court a duty of candor. But sometimes an attorney's duty of zealous representation can conflict with the duty of candor. For example, 
The duty of zealous representation may require attorneys to avoid or minimize evidence that is detrimental to their clients. But the duty of candor may require attorneys to disclose that same evidence to the court. Canon 7 of the ABA Model Code of Professional Responsibility of 1980 stated that a lawyer should represent a client zealously within the bounds of the law. Ethical Consideration 7-1 provided the duty of a lawyer both to his client and to the legal system is to represent his client zealously within the bounds of the law, which includes disciplinary rules and enforceable professional regulations. Among other things, Disciplinary Rule 7-101A provided, A lawyer shall not intentionally fail to seek the lawful objectives of his client through reasonably available means permitted by law and the disciplinary rules. When the ABA adopted the Model Rules of Professional Conduct in 1983, it did not use the term zealous representation. Instead, Model Rule 1.3 provided, A lawyer shall act with reasonable diligence and promptness in representing a client. However, comment one observed, A lawyer should pursue a matter on behalf of a client despite opposition, obstruction, or personal inconvenience to the lawyer, and take whatever lawful and ethical measures are required to vindicate a client's cause or endeavor. A lawyer must also act with commitment and dedication to the interests of the client and with zeal and advocacy upon the client's behalf. A lawyer is not bound, however, to press for every advantage that might be realized for a client. For example, a lawyer may have authority to exercise professional discretion in determining the means by which a matter should be pursued. The lawyer's duty to act with reasonable diligence does not require the use of offensive tactics or preclude the treating of all persons involved in the legal process with courtesy and respect. Today, courts and scholars continue to refer to an attorney's duty of zealous representation. Some questions to think about during this lecture. What is the scope of that duty? What should it be? How should attorneys and courts balance the duty of zealous representation against an attorney's duties to the court and to society as a whole? Now, a brief history of the legal profession and the profession before the 1908 ethics rules. The American legal profession was significantly unregulated for most of the 18th and 19th centuries. In fact, applying contemporary definitions in which a profession is self-regulating, it is not clear lawyers' work during this time was part of a unified legal profession at all. That's not to say lawyers did not play an important role in American society. Lawyers fulfilled not just one, but two equally important roles, as advocates for their clients and agents of the court. Before the organized American legal profession with formal rules, this dual role model of lawyering shaped how lawyers thought about their professional responsibilities and standards for their conduct. Many lawyers' everyday work primarily concerned advocating for the private interests of clients. 18th and 19th century clients sought out lawyers for many of the same reasons people obtain lawyers today including settling disputes over personal property, navigating commercial matters, and resolving all sorts of other conflicts between people. Although some of the events leading people to seek lawyers' assistance may seem familiar, the social, economic, and political conditions of the 19th century meant even this familiar rule was anything but routine. The dramatic period between the American Revolution in the 20th century, was full of dramatic changes in the law, the work of lawyering, and the legal profession. The law itself became more voluminous and complex. 
beginning with post-revolution efforts to create orderly state and federal governments. Instrumentalist theories about law, combined with the rapidly changing industrial society, contributed to the idea that practicing judges, lawyers, and scholars could actively shape the world they worked in. Often, this was in response to their work for the private interests of clients. Although records of conversations among lawyers show continued concern for and attention to their public responsibilities as well. Now, the American Association's Ethics Rules. The American Bar Association was founded in 1878. It advanced its first attempt at a uniform standard of conduct for lawyers in 1908. The canons of professional ethics were intended to be a general guide for lawyers based on existing professional norms expressed in legal ethics scholarship and some state bar association literature. The ABA acknowledged the idealistic nature of the canons and did not intend for them to be enforceable. For an overview of the canons, see the preamble and the list of canons from the final committee report on 1908 ABA ethics rules. The ABA canons of professional ethics were an important step towards professionalizing lawyers' work. While no longer in force, the canons guided lawyers' professional standards for a 60-year period in which the modern profession emerged. Judicial opinions and state bars often referred to the text of and principles in the canons. Attempts to apply the canons revealed some challenges with moving from generalized principles to enforceable boundaries prompting the ABA to work towards the model code of professional responsibility and moving to the model code of professional responsibility. The ABA House of Delegates approved the model code of professional responsibility, a comprehensively revised set of rules on August 12, 1969. The model code marked a significant shift from the canons in its organization and scope. Where the canons were idealistic and relied on external judgments to clarify conflicting priorities and refine broad goals, the model code contained three distinct but interrelated parts. Canons, ethical considerations, and disciplinary rules. The canons stated the general rules, which led to the ethical considerations and disciplinary rules. The ethical considerations were the aspirational principles. The disciplinary rules were mandatory statements about the minimum standards of conduct lawyers must adhere to in order to not face disciplinary action. Each canon might contain a dozen or more ethical considerations and disciplinary rules. The model code, in various forms and versions, was the ABA's central document on professional responsibility from 1970 through 1981. While no longer in use, it's important to know about the model code. Many important cases decided during this time, and some states' rules still contain references to and evidence of the influence of the model code. Now moving to the model rules of professional conduct. The shift from idealistic canons to boundary rules in the model code created the need for specificity the model code did not always address. To deal with this challenge, the ABA formed a commission to study the problem. The commission focused on developing the minimum standards of conduct for lawyers into a series of black-letter rules. The resulting model rules, adopted in 1983, are the basis of the current model rules of professional conduct. The model rules have a regulatory structure with a statement of minimum conduct and explanatory comments. The official comments are similar to other regulatory comments in that they might contain information about the reasoning behind a rule or examples to guide application. Like other model rules, 
The model rules of professional conduct are not themselves binding. They are designed to be examples a state may choose to adopt into law. For example, from the model rules, see the Rule 1.1 on competence. Rule 1.1 competence states that a lawyer shall provide competent representation to a client. Competent representation requires the legal knowledge, skill, thoroughness, and preparation reasonably necessary for the representation. Adoption of the model rules. States adopted the structure of the model rules fairly quickly. Today, almost all states' disciplinary rules follow the numbering system of the model rules. The content of state rules varies, so it's important to follow the law of your jurisdiction. Since the model rules of professional conduct have been so influential, lawyers can look to these model rules just like they might look to other uniform laws or model acts. Thanks, everybody. This is the end of Section 1. Take care.